countdown to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Miracle Man, Miracle Man, written by Neil Gaiman, drawn by Mark Buckingham. Miracle Man. Does, or does he get wet or does the water get him? <laughs> exactly! I swear, I swear Buckingham Gaiman is like the next rock act after Buckingham Nix. <laughs> hey, it's the last comic shop. We may be giants, I don't know. It depends on whether you continue to listen to us or not. Um, I don't think we are. I, <laughs> I don't know if that's how I'd use my pin particles because, you know, you're, you're exposing a lot of stuff at giant size. <laughs> it is true. Could you imagine the pit stains you'd have at a giant size level? Boy, yeah. if you sneeze somewhere, people are going to see everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Any case, uh, we hope that you see everything on this week's show. I'm the host with most, Andy Larson, and I'm joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott, as always. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed my little tribute to uh, one of my favorite bands, and they might be giants with their great song, Particle Man, except I was clever and changed the word slightly <laughs> so that it was Miracle Man, because that's the book we're reading today uh, in honor of the multi- uh, Eisner Award winning writer Neil Gaiman, uh, as well as the fact that it is up for an Eisner this year for Best Limited Series, which is kind of weird because it hasn't even wrapped up yet. Like, there's still issues to come. In fact, one of the issues is coming out like later this week. I don't know how this all works. But in any case, uh, we've got other Eisner Award nominees on today's program because we're going to educate you on one of the biggest awards that comic books uh, bestows on its industry, uh, given out at the San Diego Comic-Con in just a short week and a half. So, yeah, J.A., you've got a huge list for us. I do. I have a list for us to chew over. We're going to start with Best Continuing Series 6. Series is up for awards. Daredevil by Chip Zdarsky, Marco Cicchetto, and Rafael De La Torre. The Department of Truth by James Tinian and Martin Simmons. Philadelphia, which sounds like Philadelphia, but yeah, I have no <laughs> idea about that one. I'm but not... but but nicer. No, but they're 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 just as clever as me with my Particle Man song. <laughs> uh, by Rodney Barnes and Jason Shaw Alexander. The Nice House on the Lake by Mr. The Fourth, James Tinian, and Alvaro Martinez Bueno. Nightwing by Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo. And She-Hulk by Rainbow Rowell, Rose Antonio, Luca Maraseska, and Takashi Mayagazawa. Okay. Well, last year, if you remember, this particular category was a tie. I believe it was a Tinian book. I can't remember which one. Maybe it was... Something is Killing the Children. But it was tied with Bitter Root. I know for that, for sure. There you go. Um, so maybe there'll be a tie again this year. I'm hoping not. I, I kind of like winners and other folks. If you're going to keep awards. But I mean, it's a creative endeavor. So how you... Chad, real quickly, who do you think is going to win? So out of these, the two books that I'm reading on a regular basis are uh, Daredevil by Chip Zdarsky uh, and Nightwing by Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo. I've heard great things about She-Hulk and the Tinian stuff. While I've enjoyed Tinian, it's, his writing traditionally hasn't been my bag, so I, I, my vote wouldn't go for those guys. And between uh, Daredevil and Nightwing, I'm giving Nightwing the nod, just because it has that little extra tinge of hopefulness to it. Whereas the Zadarsky Daredevil run, it's been very dark. Mm. Very, very dark. At the end of the day, if I'm going to reach for one, it's going to be Tom Taylor's uh, Nightwing every time. All right. J.A., what is your thoughts? One, I would like to point out, I was remiss in saying that we've got two books from Marvel, two books from DC, and two books from Image mm. on this list. So uh, if you're keeping track of the studios, who's <laughs> winning and losing on that one? I also echo Chad in that wanting Nightwing to win. I really enjoyed uh, when we read Nightwing. If it continued in the same vein, then I think it's the book that deserves and. Tinian's gotten all the love in the past. He doesn't need any more love. Yeah. <laughs> Spread it out. Plenty of love. Spread out the love a bit. Uh, I don't have a horse in this race, honestly. I guess by default I'm going with Nightwing, although like none of these books really grab me and say like, yeah. Although I, I think now I, I, I might read She-Hulk 
now that She-Hulk's on the list. I have uh, genuinely liked She-Hulk in the past. So to have a She-Hulk book that's up for an honor like this, I mean, maybe I should be checking that out. So yeah. We'll see. And I, I can't hear enough good things about Rainbow Rowell as a writer. And so I'd be down for that, too. Cool. All right. What's our next category? Best limited series. Uh, that is where Miracle Man by Gaiman and Buckingham, the Silver Age, comes from that we are reading today. We also get Animal Castle by Xavier Dorinson and Felix Delap out of Ablaze Studios. Batman One Bad Day, edited by Dave Wygodes and Jessica Barbe from DC. The Human Target by Tom Ting and Greg Smallwood. Also DC and Superman Space Age by Mark Russell, Mike Allred, and Laura Allred. Also DC, something we read in the past. So a lot of DC in the best limited series. All right. Well, let's start off with you this time. What do you think? Ooh, I think it's probably going to be The Human Target. Uh, That's a book that I've been eyeing and I think we're going to read later in the year. I don't think Superman Space Age gets it, though Miracle Man is it. It's got this great pedigree, and and it's an ongoing series that's been sort of on and off since 1982, I think, or 81. We'll get into the history of Miracle Man later in the show. So that's going to split sort of the the vote for the old fogies who who like to (laughs) sip their wine and and eat cheese when they read their comic books. Ah, Chad? Uh, so, yeah, this is another one. Animal Castle, I, I will admit, I have not checked that out. It's, you know, have to see that some at some point. Batman One Bad Day, some of those uh, one-shots are really awesome. Some of those are just so-so, so the quality is a little inconsistent for that. Superman Space Age, as much as I love both Mark Russell and Mike Allred, didn't do it for me. Miracle Man, I enjoyed the heck out of, uh, which we'll get to later on. But The Human Target by Tom King and Greg Smallwood. You're taking those JLI characters that I love. And then putting him in a, you know, the crime noir scenario. It's just, it combines so many things that I love. And like, we all know that Tom King, when he's on his game, can do great work. He's not even the highlight of that book. It's Greg Smallwood. Yeah. And just his art is something, something special. The colors are so vibrant and like, there's so many good things going on with the human targets. That's where my vote's going. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some good panels from Animal Castle. So I think that's on my read pile for later on this year. I'll probably be checking that out, especially now that it's up for an award. It'll probably be moved towards the top of the stack. Human Target, like my co-hosts, I'm looking forward to reading later on in the show. We're probably going to bookend this, uh, our third season with another Tom King book, uh, given that we started off the season with one. But uh, I don't know, when it comes to Human Target, like, again, those the, the covers and the Greg Smallwood art is really what was getting me to really pay attention to that book. So I was just like, oh. I think he's up for an individual award. So maybe I'll, I'll save that for best artist and give the nod to miracle man just because i think that's an event a a series that's been going on for a long time as we'll get to later in the show what's up next ja best new series and uh this is the first time that marvel or dc does not have a series up for an award yeah Uh, we get the atonement bell by jim osley and tyler b ruff out of red five Love Everlasting by Tom King and Elsa Chartier from Image. Public Domain by Chip Zdarsky, also out of Image. Star Trek by Colin Kelly, Jackson Lansing, and Ramon Rosanis from IDW. And Traveling to Mars by Mark Russell and Roberto Mel from Ablaze. Well, with this one, I'll have to show my ignorance. I haven't read any of them, honestly, which is sad, but I haven't. So this is actually a nice collection of books that should now be again in my read pile and i think the one that i'm interested in reading the most the public domain book i've heard a lot of good things and i've liked chip sardesky a lot in the past so i think i'm just going to give that the nod chad yeah this is one that exposes my ignorance here as well because i did pick up an issue of love everlasting that i found in, in one of the discount bins and I heard that Tom King is doing great stuff with the romance genre. So that's something, you know, we like to do our romance shows. Oh, yes. So we'll have to check that out at some point. 
the public domain's the only one where I've, I've read through some of the issues, and it's it's a lot of things I love. It's Chip Zdarsky on writing, Chip Zdarsky on art. It's dipping into comic book history. So by default, I can go public domain. All right, J.A.? I think I'm going to go Star Trek. I, you know, I, in the past, I've been sort of poo-pooing Star Trek in the comic books because it hasn't been very good. But uh, if it's up for an Eisner, they must be doing something right. All right. What's up next? Oh, we're going to go to Best Writer. Ooh. One of my favorite categories, honestly. Uh, we have Grace Ellis for Flung Out of Space. Tom King for Batman, Killing Time, Batman, One Bad Day, Gotham City Year One, The Human Target, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, and Love Everlasting. Because, you know, he didn't have anything to do this past year. So <laughs> Mark Russell for Traveling to Mars, One Star Squadron, Superman Space Age, and The In-Call, Psychoverse. Uh, James Tinian IV for House of Slaughter, Something is Killing the Children, Wind, The Nice House on the Lake, The Sandman Universe, Nightmare Country, The Closet, and The Department of Truth. And Chip Zdarsky for Stillwater and Daredevil. That's a, it's a stacked list, honestly. From top to bottom, those are all writers that I love. But yeah, Tom King's getting this. He just writes good stuff. I mean, he's consistently been writing good stuff. Not to say the other ones haven't, but like, man, he's the bee's knees. Chad? So I'm going to say, out of this list, that you know, similar to you, I, I, I've enjoyed work from all these guys. The Zadarsky stuff, though, uh, a little too dark for me this year. Uh, I, I miss, like, funny, punny chip. I want more of that. Uh, the James Tinian stuff doesn't always speak to me. Uh, Mark Russell, I'll be honest, I was a little let down with One Star Squadron and some of the Superman stuff we've read this year. And Grace Ellis, I, I've not read the Flung Out of Space, so that's something to put on my list. But Tom King, I, his uh, Batman Killing Time was tons of fun. He had all the different villains. His One Bad Day had that Riddler story. Yes. And uh, that was delightful. Uh, Supergirl woman of tomorrow. We haven't talked about on the show. That was a series. I really enjoyed, although I don't know if it stuck the ending, but uh, there's so many things in here that Tom King's done. He, he takes my vote. Although I, I would be willing to wager that James Tinian's going to take it again, just because everybody loves James Tinian. Oh, uh, J.A. Well, I was going to say that James Tinian will not get it simply because he took it last year. Mm. And there'll be some apathy in the voting to oh, give it maybe. back to him again. Can he go back to back? So I think Tom King just, I mean, based on the the strength of the work, but also the volume of yes. what he put out this year. It was just like one hit after another. I'm There's a lot to be Tom considered. Yeah. Yes. All right, so on the flip side, what, we got best artist or best penciler best, next? Best penciler, inker, or penciler, inker team. Okay. Jason Sean Alexander for Philadelphia. Alvaro Martinez Bueno for The Nice House on the Lake. Sean Phillips for Follow Me Down and The Ghost in You. Bruno Redondo for Nightwing or the eventual winner, Greg Smallwood for The Human Target. <laughs> yes. I already commented. I think that Greg Smallwood makes that series. Although, and, and don't get me wrong, the Tom King on writing duties is wonderful. But those covers, my goodness, every single one was just, I don't know, museum quality. Like, I would give him the award just for the covers alone. Chad? Yeah, it's, it's hard to argue against Greg Smallwood. I mean, that's just, there's such a feeling whenever you pick up that book. That, that permeates and so not to denigrate any of those other artists you know i love bruno redondo you know i love sean phillips um it's it's great Swal smallwood's award to lose all right and then the final one we're going to look at is best writer artists and we've got some new names and uh we always like to look at the eisners as oh maybe something we should be uh looking on future shows sarah anderson for cryptid club kate beaten for ducks two years in the oil sands is that about uh like palm olive cleaning and maybe oh that's sad <laughs> espe for the pass is that like that hall pass movie with owen wilson <laughs> <laughs> we can just let him get through this category <laughs> junji ito for black paradox the liminal zone and zoe thorogood for it's lonely at the center of the earth 
Yeah, that one's taken. That's the indie darling this year. Like every time I turned around, I couldn't I couldn't swing a dead cat without seeing somebody was like, I was reading It's Lonely at the Center of the Universe this year. It's going to be probably a read pile on the last comic shop eventually because like, again, so many people were reading it. So like, we're not dumb. We need to have popular books. Well, we are kind of dumb. <laughs> and, and, and these yeah. these are all yeah. most of these, with the exception of "It's Lonely at the Center of the Earth," with his, which is an image book. These are all out of non traditional comic book studios. Uh, Sarah Anderson's book was from Andrews McNeil. Kate Beaton's book is drawn in quarterly. Espe, the pass is from Penn State University. So it's a Nitley Lion, apparently. Maybe the pass is the the pass that you have to drive over when you're going from Juniata College to Penn State. (laughs) Going up 26. Oh, man. There's like three people listening to our podcast that got that one. Any case, Chad, what are you getting for this particular category? Um, I'm going to vote for... Do a powerbomb for best team publication. (laughs) Uh, no, I honestly I haven't read any of these. I apologize for my jokes earlier. I, as Jay was alluding to, we're like the Eisners help raise awareness of really great stuff that's fallen under our radar, and I spend too much time looking at the Marvel DC image books, and so all of these have to at least uh, be on the list to check out the next time I, I see them. Ja, Black Paradox, the Liminal Zone. <laughs> Yes. And it both happened in the liminal zone. What's liminal? It's well, they went below the liminal zone. Right. And we're just implanting exactly. things in people's minds. Exactly. That's the so. sub. <laughs> oh, look at you, English major. Any case, we hope that uh, you stick around for the last comic shop later this month after the San Diego Comic Con. We will be recapping who were the winners eventually of these awards. And again, that will be given out next. Friday, so not this Friday upcoming, but the following Friday at the San Diego Comic Con. Before we jump off of this list, anything else in any of these categories that stuck out from you as a project you enjoyed, or because we don't have time to go through all the different categories? We've got a bunch of Hall of Famers, but I think we're going to talk about that on another show, so uh, we'll just skip over that with the exception of saying that Gary Trudeau is in. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to reading that. Oh, yeah. Do you think he knows Bill Watterson? (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure they all kind of know each other. I mean, oh yeah, you know he does. He I mean, probably this, draws him as, as, as a feather. Who who was Dan Quayle? Wasn't Dan Quayle the feather because he was light? Agree. And there's another one that was nothing, just a talking bubble. <laughs> what a Pulitzer! Damn it! Yes, he <laughs> they want a Peabody too. <laughs> In any case, we'll be back with more of the last comic shop right after these commercial breaks with Miracle Man the Silver Age, one of these Eisner nominees. So stay tuned. What if you could live with your favorite fictional characters and have a place to connect with the best nerdy neighbors and creators out there? Join us on your friendly neighborhood comic show. Every week, we keep hope, give help, and share comics with all. With games, interviews, and more, this isn't your average talk show. It's a living neighborhood. We are honored to be your CBC Comic Book Community Award-nominated Nerdy Neighborhood. So what are you waiting for? Come join the fun and join the neighborhood. It's your friendly neighborhood comic show every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Cartoon Dumpster Dive. I'm your host, Joel. And I'm your host, Andrew. Join us as we travel back in time to watch the garbage cartoons from your past. Will you remember them? Maybe. We painstakingly watch every episode of these cartoons to remind you that, hey, some things belong in the past. Our pain is your entertainment. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, we are back, and we are talking about the Eisner Award-nominated Miracle Man, The Silver Age, by Neil Gaiman and Mark Buckingham. To bring everybody a bit up to speed, because Miracle Man, this is not a new property, but it has not gone around a bit. Andrew, why don't you give us a quick sort of history primer about who is Miracle Man and why we should care and why we are reading this book. Well, it actually has its roots in another character that we've covered on the last comic shop before, and that is Shazam! Or the original Captain Marvel. You know, the Fawcett character, the big red cheese. Simply put, in 1954, English publisher 
L. Miller and Son had a lot of success in basically taking a lot of the Fawcett, Captain Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel, the Marvel family, and they would be reprinting it in, in England uh, in that post-war era. But when Fawcett had to close down operations because DC sued them about how Captain Marvel was so similar to Superman, L. Miller and Son was kind of screwed. So a comic book creator named Mick Angelo came in and he decided what he was going to do was take a lot of the concepts from Captain Marvel, like a guy that would say a magic word and turn into like an uber powerful being. So that he now was called Marvel Man. And like uh, Captain Marvel, he had a Captain Marvel Jr. that was called Young Marvel Man. And he even had a Mary Marvel, although that was called Kid Marvel Man. I don't understand why they had Young and Kid, but whatever. Long story short, there were three of them and they made up the Marvel Man family. And this went on from 1954 to about 1963. Later on, in the early 80s, Alan Moore decided to revamp Marvel Man back into the public consciousness in a completely weird and twisted way. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Like he took this candy coated superhero and he made it something that was very, very adult. But J.A., who worked on the Silver Age? Because eventually, like, Alan Moore stopped writing Miracle Man, Marvel Man Slash, and he gave it to who? But Neil Gaiman, he took it and basically he said, I've created the perfect comic book. It's all utopia. There's no war. All stories are ending. Here you go. Have fun. <laughs> uh, but Neil Gaiman sort of looked at that challenge and realized that, no, there are a lot of stories because utopia is never utopic. Uh, so this Miracle Man, which is also called Book 5, The Silver Age, which was originally and partially printed in Miracle Man, the Eclipse comics, 23 and 24. So what they did is they redrew, reprinted, and continued it in this limited series. Neil Gaiman, writer, Mark Buckingham was did the art, Jordi Belair on colors, and Todd Klein on lettering. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the series we're reading today was Eclipse went out of business. And so issue three of what we're reading today was originally supposed to be issue 24, or issue 25, but it was never published. Yes. And so when Marvel picks it up, they have their own weird history with Marvel Man, Miracle Man. But they you know, remastered those first two, and they're, they're picking up that story to its conclusion here in this, I think it's a seven-issue series. Yeah. So it's what is the 10 cent synopsis, J.A.? So what's going on with Miracle Man's utopia? And, and how okay. did it become a utopia, I guess? There's a lot of backstory in Miracle Man, not just on sort of the publishing side, as you got into, Andrew, but also the story side. And I highly recommend for anyone who is coming to this brand new and hasn't read past Miracle Man to go check out the, – there's a Wikipedia page that goes through the story arcs for each of the books because it's like essentially book one, book two, book three, book four, book five, the first three being the Alan Moore stuff. The next two, uh, book four, the Golden Age, book five, what we're reading now, the Neil Gaiman stuff. So Miracle Man, Young Miracle Man, and Kid Miracle Man, it turns out that their memories were fake. And all the like Golden Age stories of, of the, the, the Shazam-like stories were all this fake implanted stuff. And Young Miracle Man is killed. Mickey Moran, that is Miracle Man, has defeated Kid Miracle Man – who turned evil and tried to destroy the world. So now we fast forward 40 years and it's 40 years of utopia. Miracle man is conversing with aliens and he decides to bring back young miracle man in some cloning operation. And so the book starts off young miracle man who has been dead since the sixties comes back and is suddenly given a world that is out of balance and nothing like he remembered. And Oh, by the way, all his memories aren't really his memories. And he goes a little bit crazy, as anyone would. And the Silver Age really is following young Miracle Man. And as he sort of deals with finding out everything he believed in was wrong. His mentor is a god reigning around across the earth. His best friend is a mass murderer. And 40 years have passed. <laughs> have fun, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But he hasn't really aged. He's got that going for him, which is nice. 
Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, honestly, this is a book about self-discovery. Young Miracle Man is kind of like the audience surrogate, where we're all supposed to kind of go on this journey with him uh, as he's trying to figure out who the heck he is. And I mean, I, I'm I'm really happy that we're reading this particular series. If I didn't bring it home when I was talking about the history of Miracle Man, I don't know how many series are out there where you could basically say, like, for all intents and purposes, this was written by two of the titans of the comic book industry, at least in the last like 50 years. Like you're talking about it started with Alan Moore and then it's currently going on with Neil Gaiman. It, just let that sink in. There's a lot of folks that are out there that like would love to argue, like, who's a better writer? Is it Alan Moore? Is it Neil Gaiman? You get a series that was written by both of them, and it just doesn't happen very often. And I think this is a really approachable book, honestly. I thought that when I was going into this and I found it was like book five of like this ongoing series that I was going to be as lost as picking up issue what, 252 of Uncanny X-Men and having no idea what Cliss Claremont was doing. But it's nice because every single issue starts off with a recap of all the events. That 10 cent synopsis Jay said about like the battle between Miracle Man and Kid Miracle Man and the destruction of London and the setting up of the utopia. All of that is explained in a nice little synopsis text box on the first page. So you can just jump into the story and, and just kind of get lost in the waves a little bit. So, yeah, they really do go out of their way to make it new reader friendly which is one of the things that kept me from this series for the longest time because you i'd always heard about this you know i was unfinished and then marvel got the rights and then they published a couple of the reprints and they stopped publishing the reprints for like five years or so and then miracle man pops back up but the other thing too that i i find fascinating is so this book was basically started 40 some years ago and so much of it is deconstructing comic book things and you can see the little nods and like this is a universe that very much so is is similar to the real world. Like, they reference Captain Marvel Jr. They reference Superman, you know, in these books. They're, they're not afraid to take, a, a, you know, stuff that has happened in the history and incorporate it into Miracle Man. But at the same time, even though there's been that 40-plus year gap, this doesn't feel like something like, oh, in the 40 years in, or in between, we've seen this done so many times. You know what I mean? Like, it still feels fresh. Like, I didn't realize. I read the, the book first before I realized the first two issues in the series were from the original one, just remastered. Yes. Like, it does not feel like we're reading a book from 1984, you know, at all, even though it's from 1984 and 2000, whatever year this is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it still feels fresh. It still feels like, oh, this the, the commentary that it has on comic books, it's still vivid it still has meat on the bone it's not something that's tired and played out and and mark buckingham well i'm sure we'll get into the art as we go but he's one of those artists too where his art always whether it, i first discovered him on fables and he did some spider-man work he has one of those timeless styles like it it fits so seamlessly whether we're talking about silver age stuff or we're talking about golden age stuff or like you can see it all working with the Mark Buckingham art. Yeah. What really struck me going into the history of the book and then what Gaiman has done since he took over from Moore is how groundbreaking it truly was. I mean, this came out before Watchmen. Before Batman, before Watchmen. Before, before Watchmen too. yes. <laughs> and before Watchmen Doomsday Clock. So, yeah. yeah. It's got that going for it. But before the whole idea that you can take these hollowed comic book characters and deconstruct them. And, and I think that Gaiman gets it where a lot of people sort of just went to that hyper violence and hyper kinetic storytelling. But they lost the aspect of the soul of the superhero where Gaiman, it's really interesting to see young Miracle Man acts as a really great audience surrogate in this book because if you haven't read the other ones he's the perfect in i think that's what also makes this so good it's so easy to pick up as you said andrew because you don't have to know that 
Wolverine was up on the cross on Uncanny X Men 251 to get to 252 and understand why the Reavers are going after him. That's that's what 252 was. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to know that. You get this great audience surrogate in Young Miracle Man and his journey of self discovery. You get some great new characters. Uh, who doesn't love Meta Maid? Well, she keeps trying to get everybody to love Meta Maid. <laughs> yes. No, she's she's not as thirsty as that other one, the the half sister who just wants to screw everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It turns out a Miracle Man has lots and lots and lots of kids, but some of them are pretty. Thirst. Where does he go to? He could have done anything. He could have been any kind of god, but he decided to be the Greek gods. How boring is that? But he can't even do Zeus right because unlike Zeus, who goes out and beds all these women as swans and, and other things, he just sends out his sperm in a in like a vial. How boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that issue three with Kid Miracle Man, uh, who is kind of like the devil to Miracle Man's god. And the antithesis, the uh, the adversary, as it were, yeah, the fallen angel. Um, he is really trying to tempt young Miracle Man in that issue, and you you can see why. Like it's one of those things where it's there are a lot of like allegories to like biblical things in this series, and a lot of sexuality. This is not a book for kids for sure, but it is very nuanced and very layered, and. If you think for a second that what Alan Moore and now eventually Neil Gaiman, uh, what they did with, like, say, the reimagining of Swamp Thing or Watchmen, this is really predates all of that is what they did with Miracle Man. And it's just continuing to go forward how they're telling the story. And it's it, it's hard. It's really about a character that never really got to know who he was. He, he, uh, there's a lot of talk within this book about Dickie Dauntless's sexuality that's played up a lot as a young adult. You go through certain things in figuring out who you are, even from that perspective. And, and Dickie hasn't had an opportunity to do any of that. And it's kind of being like forced upon him, whether it's like Miracle Man as you read in this or uh, Meta Maid as you read in this. It's a, a self-exploration that I think we all go through in life. I think it's a very universal story. And it's not just a discovery of who he is or truth. It's it's really discovering like who he is really because Dicky Dauntless is this made up name that was given to him possibly. And so he's trying to figure out where he came from because he doesn't know what is real and what is not in his head. He's got all these old memories of him fighting, you know, golden age Shazam like fights, which they reprint. In some of these issues, it's quite interesting. They they show you some of the original Marvel Man at that time and young Marvel Man stories from the 60s, from the 50s, as flashbacks. Right. right. And some of those names are wonderful. Like, Young Nasty Man. Or- yeah. <laughs> young Nasty Man, because he was YN then. Yes, Young Nasty Man. <laughs> Which sounds like a rapper. Look out, little Yachty. So you have the level where it's the commentary on the the things that happen in in comic books. And you have the whole, you know, this was the plucky kid sidekick. And Miracle Man goes to the plucky sidekick and, like, I think there's something you you know you've wanted. And gives him the smooch. And it's like the Frederick Wortham. Yeah. Like, holy cannoli. And, And what is it about Neil Gaiman that allows this guy to write gods? And make them relatable and understandable. Right. There, there's something not right about that. We really need to look into this Neil Gaiman guy. <laughs> but I, I, I agree with what you said about the Frederick Wortham and the seduction of the innocent. Because, again, one of the big things that was brought up in that show trial in front of the Senate or whatever was whether, like, the relationship between Batman and Robin was a, you know, a homosexual relationship or something like that. And I think this plays into that. You've got this young ward type character and they're like... Well, is he? Is he not? Does it matter? Oh. I think that's the that's the key point. It's like this this kid has never even had an opportunity to figure that out for himself. Well, every sexual interaction in this book seems like it's so the product of a twelve year old mentality. Right. You know, like whether it's Meta Maid, be like, hey, you want me to stay in your bunk? <laughs> or whether it's that redheaded girl, you know, as soon as he meets her, it's like, hi, I'm Sally. What a f- like it's it's a very immature look at how these processes work, but 
it fits. It, I I don't know how it all fits, but like I don't know. It's there's so many levels going on here. My mind's just gonna explode, and I'm gonna I'm gonna blame Neil Gaiman. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get to our commercial break. We'll be right back with more of our final thoughts and ratings and recommendations right after this message. Hello, friends. Do you like the 80s and Transformers? We are the Autopod Decepticast, and we started our podcast doing a minute-by-minute breakdown of the 1986 classic animated feature, Transformers the Movie. We've since moved on to an episode-by-episode review of the G1 series and just started Season 3. We have over 180 episodes, so if you're just discovering our show, there's plenty of gold to stuff into your ears. And it is very funny and fantastic. I'm not biased... We are on every podcast aggregator you could possibly stomach. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and our web presence is autopoddecepticast.com. We are at apoddecast on Twitter and all of the things. Autopod Decepticast, friends, for all your animated Transformer needs. Hi, folks. This is Sean. This is Nerd Podcast. If you enjoy genuine conversation from Two guys who love the subjects that they're talking about, you need to check us out. Just search Pittsburgh Nerd on some of your favorite podcast catching apps, or you can also check out our vlog on YouTube. Just search Pittsburgh Nerd. We're really, really easy to find. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our ratings. It's a miracle if we can get through this rating section without saying how wonderful Neil Gaiman is as a writer. Because I'm going to say it a couple times. This was an absolute pleasure to read. And I'm so glad, as I mentioned before, that we are reading Miracle Man on a particular show. If I haven't said it again, Last Comic Shop fans, if you haven't read it and you're the appropriate age, you should be reading Miracle Man. You should check it out from beginning to end, including the Silver Age, which we're reading on today's show. Final thoughts before we get to ratings real quick. Uh, J.A., you had some questions about Miracle Woman? Yeah, she seems to be so she's a newer character, at least to Dickie Dauntless. Um, she wasn't around in the original Golden Age run. I don't know if she if she shows up in book four, the Golden Age. But in this book, she's really pulling the strings of Miracle Man. She's the one who suggests she sh- he should kiss young Miracle Man and sort of opens up young Miracle Man's eye, and, you know, sends him on this journey of discovery i don't think miracle man thought that that's what was going to happen but i think she did there's something going on with her and what's up with winter yes the the first daughter who's naked all the time and floats around and can disappear i don't know what's your theory because she seems to know everything well it's it's a play on some other sci-fi books you know from further back like arthur c Clarke's childhood's end Aliens come to the Earth to shepherd in like a new race of humanity. Ultimately, that's what winter is. Like, that's the only reason why these other aliens that Miracle Man deals with let Earth exist is because they were like, oh, well, if you can create something like winter, well, then, you know, this world is worth keeping around for a little while. And that's one of my favorite issues is actually issue four that deals with like these Jack Kirby-esque creations, these giant mountain men that are like basically running the entire alien conglomerate or whatever and they're like yeah we don't know about earth yeah, well we might have to take it into the shop and miracle woman's like how dumb can you be miracle man they're out to get us so uh she's definitely pulling the strings by the way if you ever read the original miracle man done by alan moore there's a pretty graphic sex scene between miracle man and miracle woman above the skies of london as they do the nasty where everyone Which can everyone see. could see <laughs> exactly. chad final thoughts we haven't finished this story so it's very rarely on the show do we read stories that aren't yet completed and i can't wait to get to the end of this story there's so much here there's such a sadness in some of the characters. We had just read the whole Captain America Winter Soldier arc where they bring Bucky back out of time. And it's like, uh, there's just so many things that happen in comic books where I can draw parallels to this and like, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, I, like I said, there's layers on top of layers on top of layers on top of layers and it's not done yet. And I, I can't wait to get the rest of it. And I'm pretty sure my brain's going to explode before that happens. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's explode with some ratings. So, J.A., what's our rating scale for this week? So our rating scale is going to be one out of four deconstructions. This is all about deconstructing the hero genre, deconstructing comic books, deconstruction of mentality and, and who you are and what you become. So one out of four deconstructions. Yeah. Well, I'm going to start off by saying, like, if you haven't noticed, this is a four. But I, I think I'm going to put an asterisk by the four to say, like, this is a four because of the in totality of what Miracle Man is, right? I think even today, we're just talking about the Silver Age. Like, that is just a small sliver of this story that's been going on for, like, 40 years that is some of the best storytelling in comics, like between Alan Moore and and Neil Gaiman, with wonderful art by a lot of great people, not only Mark Buckingham on the more recent stuff, but the late, great uh, Gary Leach. He actually drew Miracle Man when Alan Moore was, was writing it. And if you haven't checked out his stuff, it's wonderfully gorgeous. And I can't wait again for the, the next two issues, issue six, issue seven. They're already teasing in issue seven. There's going to be a fight between Miracle Man and Young Miracle Man based on the cover. And I think that's really what this series is about. Young Miracle Man has the potentiality to be another kid Miracle Man where he like lays waste to this utopia. He right now, he's neither good nor he's bad. He's like in the middle. And his decisions and what he finds out on his journey are going to decide what happens next. And that's very exciting from a narrative perspective, that kind of uncertainty about what ha- what's going to happen with Young Miracle Man. So it's a four. Jad? I was going to say, you're forgetting the most exciting part about this. And I, I've known this from reading various articles, but Mark Buckingham is an artist's artist. And he will, like, sculpt things and sculpt characters out of clay when he's working on books and see them from different angles. And the back matter in here, not only do they show the pages from back in the 80s when he initially was working on the book, they also show how he crafted the alien ships out of Lego. (laughs) And how cool was that to see the the pictures of the Lego and how he translates that to art? Like, this guy's a jack of all trades and, like, the stuff he does with the Lego is even awesome. I'm mad that I have to wait for this to be finished. Now, I will say I did not read the other Miracle Man before diving into this one i just went there was an infinite comic that i read on uh, marvel unlimited mm-hmm. which caught me up to speed and i just dove in and you know just wow there's there's so much going on obviously i'm gonna go back and check out the alan moore stuff and the neil gaiman stuff that preceded it but like I, i've got a lot of stuff to read now <laughs> so yeah uh, we're looking at a four, so i have 40 plus years of reading to catch up on luckily it's not that many issues that's true <laughs> ja yeah, it's a four to me. I think actually we, we talked so much about the story and so much about Neil Gaiman, and I feel like we gave Mark Buckingham a bit of a short shrift. He actually co-wrote every issue after issues one and two because one and two were the ones that came from the original run that got redone. Uh, but he is listed as the co-writer for the rest of the books as well. So he, it's not just his art, which is incredible. And I want to talk about the art a bit. A lot of the pages are two-page spreads with panel layouts based on those two-page spreads. So, it, you know, it might have 20 panels, 15 panels, but spread out across two pages. So you have to open the book and read it flat like you're l- lying down on a on a bed and you've got the comic in front of you. Sort of how you maybe you read comic books when you were a kid or, or on the floor with the – with the newspaper on the Sunday funnies, just beautiful art, beautiful coloring. Uh, As Chad said, not only do you see the, the Lego constructs that he has made, but you see a lot of the panel work and how he came, you know, how his initial sketches turned into final drawings. And then the inks came in. Uh, Did you notice how Dickie Dauntless dreams? He dreams in black and white comic book panels. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool. So, yeah, I think it's great. I can't wait to finish the series and, like Chad, go back and have to read a whole lot of other stuff. (laughs) Thank you very much. All right. Well, some other stuff that we're hopefully that you'll read are some of our recommendations. We don't have a lot of time, so these are going to be short for this week. So, real quickly, a couple recommendations, starting with Chad. All right. So, Mark Buckingham, I talked about Fables. That was great. 
But I really loved uh, his run with Paul Jenkins on Peter Parker, Spider-Man. This was happening concurrently with the JMS run uh, back in the day. And there are really some some wonderful, like, done-in-one, heartfelt Spider-Man stories that really don't get the respect they deserve. So if you can track down those issues, sometimes you can find them in the, the discount bins or in the back issue bins. Uh, you're looking around issues uh, 30 or so from Peter Parker, Spider-Man, with art by Mark Buckingham, stories by Paul Jenkins. There's some of the best Spider-Man stories that are that are hidden away in that side book uh, that are worth your attention. Yes. All right. So my recommendation this week is uh, an Eisner Award winner from last year, and that is Ultra Mega. As part of my summer Read by the Pool series, nothing's better than a good old monster fight in the middle of the summertime, whether you were watching it on you know, the drive-in movie theaters or whatever. Uh, and, and Ultra Mega is that. Uh, it's a little bit more bloodthirsty than your traditional monster movie, but it is a battle between awesomely giant people with blasters and, the, you know, and, and, and kaiju. Um, and... and, and, and there's a lot to this particular story because, again, it's not just about the battle between, uh, you know, Ultra Mega and the Kaijus, but how they have a symbiotic relationship, how when the original Ultra Mega dies, there's like some sort of weird dystopian birth that develops with like cults that worship the Kaiju and the other ones that worship the Ultra Mega. I, it's really, really great stuff and so i can't recommend it enough you should pick up ultra mega you should read it for no other reason than like our miracle man it really does illustrate how gods battle and how really that would impact the world if you had these like i don't know 100 feet tall beings just punching through skyscrapers yeah the art is crazy bananas awesome too yeah Jay All right, X. I'm going to recommend Earth X, Ooh. which is a Marvel comics came out in 1999 based on ideas off of Alex Ross, written by Jim Kruger and drawn by John Paul Leone. The story that I like the best is the Dazzler story, where she retires from superheroes and falls back on her music career, but then she becomes a washed up relic. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and because she's like a product of old 80s and she's doing comeback tours to smaller and smaller careers, she'll end up probably playing in like a small mall somewhere. Uh, so it <laughs> takes them and, and twists it a bit in that what we've been talking about this whole show of, of looking at superheroes or maybe they're not so super or heroic in yes. the end. It, it, it essentially turns Dazzler into Tiffany. <laughs> I think we're alone now. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. That is a summertime hit. Hey, I, you know, that might be one of those recommendations that later on we read on the last comic shop, uh, as we sometimes do, because I've been wanting to read Earth X on this show for a really, really long time. So I'm excited that you recommended it, buddy. Yeah. A lot of folks like just say it's like the Marvel version of Kingdom Come, but I think it's again there's a lot of differences there so i remember snagging that omnibus from ollie's from out from under you (laughs) (laughs) i still need to read (laughs) any case well it's time to wrap up the show and we're gonna do it in our traditional style of really fast so chad what do you got for us all right recommendations include miracle man by gaiman and buckingham they include ultra mega by james heron they include earth x by alex ross jim krueger and some other folks, Jean Paul Leon among them. They include the book I recommended, Peter Parker Spider Man by Paul Jenkins and Mark Buckingham. Uh, Andy, where can people go to find cool stuff? That's the www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com as well as bcwsupplies.com. Make sure that you're getting using that promo code LCSPOD to get 10% off your order of all that comic book greatness. J.A., tell us about social media. We've got Twitter. We've got Facebook, I guess. We've got some other stuff. YouTube, if you want to watch some fun videos. But yeah, more, yeah, more, yeah. Ooh. Go back to the home site. <laughs> On our homepage, where you can find it all. We also have a link to our merch store. T-shirts, tote bags, coffee mugs, and this week only stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Deconstructed. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been fun. Deconstructed stuff. There we go. Andy, give us a dad joke and get us out of here. All right. We'll be back next week with more Last Comic Shop as well as more stuff leading up to San Diego Comic Con. Until then, I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson. I'm joined by Chad Smith, Jay Scott, and we hope that you stay safe, stay miraculous, and remember that if this summer you're planning on just weighing rainbows, don't bother. I've heard they're pretty light. Ah, uh, I get that. That took me a minute. Ah, you see? I'm a clever son of a bitch. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> what about double rainbows? Across the sky, so intense. <laughs> <laughs> Comic Shop was a 2023 Black Angus production.